we have some preliminaries. So I'm gonna go ahead and, and uh, uh, get started with those. Uh, welcome uh, all of you to uh, the St. John's College Dean's Lecture and Concert Series uh, in Santa Fe. Uh, for those of you who don't know, I'm Walter Sterling, the Dean of the College in Santa Fe, and we're glad to have you all joining us uh, this evening. It is the uh, last lecture of our very long year, and uh, I, I just want to take a moment to um, thank uh, all of our speakers and panelists and really our whole community for engaging in this uh, series over the last uh, 12 months now since the disruption. And uh, we will continue to have uh, uh, lectures available this summer in the Graduate Institute Lecture Series, but I believe the next Dean's Lecture will be back in the Great Hall at the start of the fall semester. So. This feels in some ways like the end of, of a long journey and uh, uh, it's been challenging, but it's been wonderful to have our community continue to come together uh, to learn from one another, engage in conversation. And uh, of course, in some ways to have things be possible that were not possible before uh, bringing folks together from both campuses uh, and from all over and all parts of our community. Um, I'll remind you that the lecture this evening will occur in this webinar format for the next hour. And as soon as the lecture ends, we'll close the webinar and we'll open the Zoom meeting for a question period in which we can see one another and talk together. That link was shared with the lecture link, but I'll also put it in the chat thread uh, in, the, in the last couple minutes of the lecture. Uh, as you know, uh, our tradition is not to introduce our own, uh, but in this format, I have at least wanted to welcome uh, my colleagues uh, and uh, if not give them the introduction they deserve. And uh, Mr. Pagano will, will, will end that semi-tradition this year. Uh, I, I just wanna thank and welcome my colleague, uh, tutor Frank Pagano, long serving tutor. Uh, he's taught throughout the program, undergraduate and both of our master's programs, and he served the college in almost every way uh, imaginable uh, that we ask our, our faculty to, to serve in. Uh, he's a very witty man, and even as I make these comments, I can imagine uh, all sorts of wry remarks that he might make. Uh, I'll just uh, sum up my, my, my gratitude and uh, 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 and welcome uh, for Mr. Pagano by saying that one of the things we, we ask about our colleagues is whether they're a teacher of tutors. And uh, I, I can't think of anybody of whom that's more true. I know all of my colleagues and I uh, feel that we learn from Mr. Pagano from his many lectures and uh, any of the other settings in which we work with him. So in that spirit, uh, thank you. Uh, Mr. Pagano for uh, being willing to join us tonight and offer the last lecture of the year. Uh, and um, please join me now in welcoming Mr. Pagano, whose lecture is titled Father and Son Fen. Mr. Pagano. Well, thank you very much. Uh, I wonder if anybody's, any tutors ever learned from me, but we'll, we'll, we'll see about that. I want to say two things before I launch the ship. Um, one is that <clears throat> occasionally I'll quote the text and I'll say altered because I've altered it. The second thing I wanted to say before I started, and, and this lecture probably isn't worthy of, of it, but I did want to dedicate this to those two great intelligences, uh, Jonathan Hand, and Carrie Stickney. So this lecture isn't up to their level, but uh, it's the best I can do. So I'm gonna launch now. Okay, so here we go. And, and you know, since I can't tell if anyone's laughing, this will have fewer jokes than usual because you know, what's a joke that no one laughs at? Okay, here we go. I never seen anybody but lied one time or another. So says Huckleberry Finn. Yet the critic Lionel Trilling judges that the greatness of the novel Huckleberry Finn lies primarily in its power of telling the truth. 
Truth is the whole of a boy's conscious demand upon the world of adults. Finally, he claims that unlike adults, boys do not lie to themselves. Who to believe, the boy or the adult critic? This seems to be the right question to put to the boy who educated 20th century Americans, which is why this, this book is so important. Tocqueville, one of the reasons, Tocqueville reports that 19th century Americans were educated by the Bible and Shakespeare. Twain embodies the education bestowed by the Bible in the king and by Shakespeare in the Duke, the democratic frauds of royalty and nobility appearing in the novel. We might conclude that these frauds justify democracy since it seems that the king and the Duke reflect the fraudulent character of all monarchies and aristocracies. They may be, however, merely the democratic interpretations of monarchy and aristocracy, both men revealing the narrow horizons of democracy. Are they the true democratic understandings of the Bible and Shakespeare? Part one, compassion. This afternoon, we are to determine whether Huck is the boy of truth, and if so, whether his truth is good for American democracy. It is apparent that he is the boy of compassion. This is easily shown. Jim revealed to the family holding him captive. Jim, of course, is the slave that accompanies uh, Huck down the river. The Phelps family, the character of the king and the duke and their none such players. Warned, the local city was prepared to welcome them in what they thought was the appropriate way namely to ride them out of town on a rail and cover them with tar and feathers. Huck responds to the sight this way. <clears throat> well, it made me sick to see. And I was sorry for them pitiful rascals. It seemed like I couldn't feel any hardness against them anymore in the world. It was dreadful to see. Humans can be awful cruel to one another. These are the rogues who betrayed Jim back into slavery. They tried to cheat orphans out of their inheritance. They invaded the raft and made life disagreeable. Didn't they receive their just reward? Why should justice not be cruel at times? Huck is Rousseau's man, or rather boy, of compassion. In the discourse on the origin of inequality, Rousseau follows Mandeville when Rousseau describes the compassion, the fellow feeling, a, per, a, per, a person in prison suffers as he witnesses a wild beast tearing a babe from its mother's arms and devouring it. Humans feel compassion when they are safe. Compassion antedates society, but it seems that it is free to be independent from other sentiments only in society. As an active character in the novel, Huck replicates the link between compassion and self-preservation that Mandeville and Rousseau illustrate. When Huck and Jim are trapped on a shipwrecked steamboat with a gang of robbers who incidentally are planning to kill one of their own by abandoning him, Huck shows no compunctions about taking their boat and leaving them on the wreck. But it weren't no time for sentimentering. We got to find that boat now, had to have it for ourselves. Only after Huck and Jim were safely downstream did Huck reflect on the situation of the murderers. I've begun to think how dreadful it was, even for murderers to be in such a fix. He makes his compassion reasonable. I says to myself, ain't no telling, but I might come to be a murderer myself. Yet, and then how would I like it? He does not reflect that by leaving the murderers on the steamboat, he might already be a murderer. Notably, his compassion gives him the capacity to put himself in the position of the, of the sufferer, even the suffering murderer. Huck then is like Mandeville's safe prisoner who exhibits compassion for the suffering child and to some extent, the mother of the child. Rousseau uses the word evanui for the behavior of the mother holding the babe, the primary meaning of which is fainted. If we follow the primary meaning, the mother fainted when her child was torn from her and she, and she left herself vulnerable to attack if the beast was not satisfied with the meal of the child. The secondary meaning of the word, however, is she vanished. This translation ties comp 
passion closer to self-preservation. The mother felt what the child felt and she ran from it to save herself. Such is a plausible explanation of the development of compassion. It is originally a component of self-preservation. Fellow feeling with the sufferer aided in the preservation of the individual with this capacity to feel what the suffering feel. Early humans then felt the suffering and knew to avoid the location of it. Compassion then is an odd social feeling. Its primitive influence was to reinforce the inclination for isolation. If compassion is among our first social feelings, the first human fellow feeling, then one of the first human social feelings is anti-social. As I mentioned, one of Huck's compassionate observations, one of his compassionate truths, is that humans can be awful cruel to one another. Compassion seems to preclude cruelty, or at least the cruelty done out of malice. There is in the novel an instance of cold cruelty. It is a murder without a touch of compassion. In a town where the king and the duke attempt their Shakespeare revival, the townspeople gather, because the perhaps because the circus is in town, or to watch the monthly spectacle of drunken old bogs ride into town and revile and threaten a townsman. In this instance, a Colonel Sureburn. Boggs accuses Sureburn of swindling him, along with everything else he could lay his tongue to. The crowd assures Huck that Boggs meant nothing of it, never hurt anybody. In short, when drunk, he's a braggart. He boasts especially about his manliness. Sherburn walks into the street and tells Boggs that he will permit Boggs accusations only until one o'clock. The crowd takes Sherburn seriously and sends for Boggs' daughter to remove him from the street. It is too late. Sherburn shoots Boggs dead right in front of his daughter. The word lynch sounds and the mob marches to Colonel Sherburn's house. Now the positions change and Sherburn becomes a kind of Boggs to the democratic mob. He vilifies them. He claims he knows them. You didn't want to come. The average man don't like trouble and danger, but if only half a man like Buck Harkness there shouts, lynch him, lynch him, you're afraid to back down, afraid you'll be found out to be what you are. Cowards, the pitiful thing out is a mob. That's what an army is, a mob. They don't fight with courage that's born in them, but with courage that's borrowed from their mass and from their offices. But a mob without any man at the head is beneath pitifulness. Unlike Sherburn, with Boggs, the mob backs down and disperses. Sherburn indicates that he has no fellow feeling with the mob. It's pitiful because no real man could have any compassion for it. Sherburn certainly styles himself as a man, independently courageous. He does not identify with those humans who gain their courage in a crowd. He's a foil to Huck. Huck receives his fellow feeling directly from feelings themselves. He identifies with suffering people because he shares their feeling of suffering. He then identifies himself with the person suffering. As he says, who knows whether he might be a murderer someday. Sherburn has no compassion for anyone who borrows his courage. Boggs needs the bottle and the mob needs the mass. Sherburn first identifies with or does not identify with, and then he does or does not have compassion for the individual. The feeling follows the identification. This is the way of civilized humans. Identification must also rely on a variety of fellow feeling. It is evidence that society has transformed compassion into feelings that allow for selective identification with others. We are interested in Sherburn chiefly in contrast to the democratic human, he regards himself as an aristocrat among these cowardly Democrats. He, however, is not quite an aristocrat since he seems to care about his reputation among the people. Otherwise, why kill a drunken fool? Sherburn cares about the falsehood that Boggs spreads. His perceptiveness about the average man applies that he shares these feelings to some extent. He claims the courage of a mob is borrowed from the mass in the case of the army from the offices. How does anyone borrow courage from a crowd that is composed overwhelmingly of cowards? What allows cowards to feel brave? How does one borrow a feeling? And this is the heart of 
the lecture about borrowing feeling. At the beginning of Sherburn, Boggs, the Sherburn of Boggs episode, Hux describes the loafers who lean against every store post in the town and chew tobacco. They seem to all get their tobacco by borrowing. This is hardly seems possible since then no one would have tobacco. The exchange Huck narrates is as follows. I wish you'd lend me a char, Jack. I just this minute give Ben Thompson the last char I had, which is a lie pretty much every time. It don't fool nobody but a stranger, but Jack ain't no stranger. So he says, you pay me back the charge you already borrowed off of me, Leif Buckner, then I'll loan you one or two tons of it and won't charge you no back interest neither. Well, I did pay you back some of it once. Yes, you did, about six jars. So you borrowed store tobacco and paid back black stock, altered. Sometimes someone has tobacco and the economy of scarcity can be relieved. The liars who claim that they recently lent somebody some tobacco can remember a time when they in fact lent some. This loafer tobacco economy has a partial resemblance to the economy involved with courage. The mass itself, according to Sherwin, lacks courage, and only those outside it, the officers, have any. The individuals in the mass, like the loafers with respect to tobacco, believe they have lent courage to others. They think the mass is courageous, and they lent the mass some of that courage, so they have no qualms about borrowing from the mass. They are merely borrowing from the mass the courage that they lent it. Yet Sherwin is wrong in the claim that the mass borrows borrows courage. In fact, the mass of men does not borrow courage itself, but rather each lends and borrows from the mass the feeling of courage. They receive no more than they give. They lend no courage, so they receive no courage. They borrow from the mass feelings of courage in the way borrow, uh, Boggs borrows the feeling of courage from alcohol. Courage for the individuals of, of the mass is a variety of fellow feeling, of a peculiar kind of compassion. Society has splinted compassion so that there is a great variety of fellow feeling. In the confrontation with Sherburn, the mob is deflated and receives no confirmation of their feeling of courage. Frequently, however, a mob is confirmed in its feelings. Mobs find affirmation of their courage in cruelty. They find victims who fear them. And in the suffering of the victims, the mob senses its strength. Mobs operate by an inverse and perverse compassion. They feel the suffering of another and exalt in it. Democratic society operates by a set of fellow feelings. It has a great investment in preserving these feelings. This is not to say that Democrats have no compassion originally understood as fellow feeling for a suffering individual. But compassion so understood is only one of several common and necessary democratic fellow feelings. This complex of fellow feelings is exhibited in the circus that Huck sneaks into the same day as the shooting of Boggs. So it didn't bother him that much. What we see in the circus is enormous variations in the feelings of the audience. It is apparent that the individuals in the audience are also an audience for the appropriate emotional responses to the circus show. They receive their emotional cues from the expression of their compatriots. Democratic society functions as an audience for the acceptable social feelings of any moment. During the horse riding, a drunk from the audience interrupted the performance and tried to get into the ring and ride a horse. The crowd made fun of him and he jeered at them. A lot of men swarmed him yelling, knock him down, throw him out, with some background screams of a couple of women. This is an example of the courage mob. The ringmaster intercedes and lets the drunk attempt to ride. He mounts the horse and flops from side to side. It seems that he will fall off. The crowd laughs. They share the feeling of an amused satisfaction that a person who stepped out of the crowd should fail. Huck does not think it's funny. He sets the natural standard for fellow feeling. Natural compassion, natural fellow feeling suffers with the sufferer. The laughter of the audience, however, is an expression of group superiority to anyone who presumes that he can be better than the crowd. They share his fe fear of falling, but it is his and not theirs. 
because he is not part of the crowd. They laugh at his danger and his feeling of fear. The same lending and borrowing go on in the audiences in the lynch mob. They lend and borrow expressions of displeasure and laughter. This is an exchange of feeling. Then the drunk stands up on the saddle and strips off his drunken clothes to reveal his circus costume. He rises above the animal by standing up on the horse by his human height. He left everybody just a howling with pleasure and astonishment. The crowd was pleased to find that the so-called drunk was not one of them, but someone so superior that he could cause astonishment. The events of the circus are encouraging. The people can be uplifted to admire real merit, especially in the activities of which they have had some experience. That they must think that the superior person does not in truth arise out of their number. The novel does not depict how the ordinary conventional American improves. It does not show the mechanism by which a democracy descends. It does show the mechanism by which a democracy descends. It again involves borrowing and the exchanging of feelings. The occasion for this descent is provided by the king and the duke. They're crucial to the corruption. The night of the murder and the circus, the duke and the king give their rendition of Shakespeare. And if their performance is similar to the rehearsal, the show is completely incoherent, words without meaning. In any case, the audience laughs and leaves before the performance is complete. The Duke concludes that the town is not up to Shakespeare, but is suited for low comedy or something worse than low comedy. The King and the Duke try again. This time they advertise the show with the warning. Ladies and children not admitted, the Duke boasts. If that line don't fetch him, I don't know Arkansas. He seems to know Arkansas very well. The house is packed and the king prances out on all fours, absolutely naked. The crowd laughs and cheers. And when the Duke announces that this prancing is the whole show, the crowd feels cheated and is about to charge the stage. Still a big fine looking man jumps up on a bench and shouts, hold on, just a word gentlemen. They stop to listen. We are sold, mighty badly sold, but we don't want to be the laughing stock of this whole town, I reckon, and never hear the last of the thing as long as we live. No, what we want is to go out of here quiet and talk up this show and sell the rest of the town. Then we'll be in the same boat. Ain't that sensible? You bet it is. The judge is right, everybody sings out. All right then. Not a word about any cell. Go along home and advise everyone to come and see the tragedy. Here the democratic impulse is advocated by the judge, one of the prominent men in the town. It is bad to be cheated, but it's worse to be known as the fool who can be cheated. Democrats would rather make everyone feel equal to themselves, even if, and perhaps especially if, it means lowering others to their level. This is not merely the love of equality, but the feeling of shame at some inferiority. Half of the town went to see the show that they thought might be lewd. How are they to sell the show, but to confirm these suspicions and entice the other to the same lewd show? Thus everyone is convicted of a kind of baseness. Moreover, they are duped by the other townsmen. The first half of the town reckons that the damage to the mutual trust by selling the second half is worse the maintenance of the feelings of equality. Democracy seems to drive down the social level of its citizens. It is revealing that the townsmen are willing to perpetrate the fraud that the king and the duke perpetrated on them against the rest of society as though they were suffering, a, as though suffering a common fraud can be a social adhesive. Here again, there's a kind of exchange. Someone duped the original audience. They feel it right compensation to dupe their fellow citizens. Otherwise, the two halves of the town cannot belong to the same society of feeling. Indeed, they feel that they borrow their shamefulness from their neighbor and repay him in the same social currency. If society is a fraud, it's a fraud perpetuated by feeling for the sake of maintaining social feelings. In the most obvious case, the courage mob, the feelings of, the, of courage make the members of the fraud feel they are, are brave, but when it comes time to meet the danger, the feeling flees.
Note, however, that the fellow feeling of courage gives the mob social cohesion. Once the feeling is lost, the mob disperses, but feelings are not actions. To feel brave is not necessarily to act bravely. Social actions, therefore, are twofold. They require fellow feeling and coordinated activity. Putting the two together is the problem of social practice. In a democracy, it seems, the fellow feeling is more important than the coordination. Part two, the social fraud. Here's a theme here. We are beginning, we return to the beginning of the inquiry in, quite, in the question of truth and falsehood. Rousseau admits that it is an early enlightenment in the human species that allowed them to practice tricking animal nature. The new enlightenment that resulted from this development, mechanical prudence, increased his natural man, superiority over the other animals by making him aware of his superiority. He practiced setting traps for them. He tricked them in a thousand ways. Of those which might serve him or hurt him, he became with time the master of the former and the scourge of the latter. We may say that it is second nature for humans to trick animal nature. The capacity to deceive is nearly the origin of humanity. Since the reflection on this practice of deceit seems to be the or origin of pride, is also the origin of inequality. That's my reading of Rousseau. It's that moment from the natural man to the, ref to the reflective man that makes that comparison. Society itself is a double conceit. The first deceit is the claim that there is private property. The first person who having fenced off a plot of ground took it in his head to say, this is mine and found people simple enough to believe him was a true founder of civil society. What kind of a deceit is the claim that this is mine when it refers to anything except one's own body? One of the questions asked of the claimants in Rousseau to private property is who gave you its, the privately owned field, dimensions? From the perspective of natural man, private property is self-deceit. The claimant thinks he has added size to himself, that he's larger than before, but in fact, before the institution of private property, he owned all the fruits of nature in common with everybody else. There were no boundaries to his world. He was free to wander wherever he wished. Giving parcels of land dimensions is self-confinement. The property owner is deceived about his freedom. Because he measures the extent of his property, he believes he has extended himself. Instead, he has put himself in a box. The second deceit is the institution of political society. The development of private property leads to the war of all against all, especially of the poor against the rich. Then someone conceived the most deliberate project ever entered into by the human mind. Rousseau gives the speech of this genius as follows. Let us unite, he says to them. To protect the weak from oppression, restrain the ambitious and secure for everyone the possession of what belongs to him. Let us institute regulations of justice and peace to which all are obliged to conform, which make an exception of no one, and which compensate in some way for the caprices of fortune by equally subjecting the powerful and the weak to mutual duties. In a word, instead of turning our forces against ourselves, let us gather them into one supreme power which governs us according to wise laws, protects and defends all the members of the association, repulses common enemies and maintains us in, in eternal concord. This little speech affects many transformations in the human condition. The first person plural becomes itself a power. Kings will use it to refer to themselves as though they were not individual humans, but individual collectives. There is an equivocation on the word weak and strong. Before the institution of political society, the rich are weak and the poor strong but the positions are reversed after the institution. Both the majority of, before the majority of people are poor but strong and after the establishment of political society, they are poor and weak. The rich become the strong. That perhaps the paramount inventions are duty and law for these political innovations make uniform the individuals joining the society. All ran to meet 
their chains, thinking they secured their freedom. The humans agreeing to join the society by making mutual obligations, think in terms of securing their property, but in fact, they are losing their freedom. They may not, for example, chase after their whims if they're marching in an army of a political society. They impose upon their individuality, social uniformity, hence the second self-deception. Already we have seen that there is much deception in society. Some of it, at least in a democracy, is self-deception. Let us return to Huckleberry Finn and examine whether American society still exhibits anything of the original deceptions, especially the original self-deceptions. In what ways have we progressed? We shall consider the fraud that the king and the duke attempt to perpetrate on the or orphans in the unnamed town on the eastern side of the Mississippi. After cross-examining a boy from the town, he's the town fool, the king and the duke pose as brothers of a recently deceased citizen of the town. They are confronted by the town's doctor as being frauds, but the town and the girls, or rather the oldest girl, who are the heirs, side with the confidence men against the doctor. The king explains, cuss the doctor. What do we care for him? Hain't we got all the fools in town on our side? And ain't that a big enough majority in any town? But how did he get the fools on his side? There are many reasons for the king's success. One of the primary reasons is fools hate to be known as fools. As we have seen in a democracy, the people wish to feel to be on the same level as their neighbors, to know as much as their neighbors. Upon meeting the king and the duke and hearing their assertion that they were looking for Peter Wilkes, this is the guy who was dead, those meeting them assume without any evidence that they are the brothers of Wilkes. Can any of you gentlemen tell me where Mr. Peter Wilkes lives? They give a glance to one another and they nodded their heads as much to say, what did I tell you? Everyone told everyone else. Each person claims the community thought. The fellow feeling of community vanity is powerful, and it may lead many to dismiss the doctor's claim to friendship, and that as a friend, he has the best interest of the three girls in mind. Moreover, the king manages to relate the names of Peter Wilkes's friends, and this again flatters the people called out. Still, the two brothers are named as heirs in the letter that serves as a will. An ordinary suspicion should put the town, if not the girls, on guard. The king makes fools of the feelings of the townspeople by satisfying their desire to express their social compassion. The king and the duke reach the coffin of the deceased, continually called either by Huck or the king, the diseased, and put on a show of suffering and mourning that causes everyone assembled to weep. The king explains his purpose ironically. Huck narrates it. Well, by and by the king, he gets up and he comes forward a little and works himself up and slobbers out a speech, all full of tears and flappadoodle about its being a sore trial for him and his poor brother to lose the diseased and to miss seeing diseased alive. After the long journey of 4,000 miles, but it's a trial sweetened and sanctified to us by this dear sympathy and those holy tears. And so he thanks them out of his heart and his brother's heart because out of their mouths they can't, words being too weak and cold and all that kind of rotten slush till it was just sickening. And then he blubbers out a pious goody goody amen and turns himself loose and goes to crying fit to bust. The king shows himself to be a superlative preacher. He understands precisely why, why people want sympathy and of equal importance, why people wish to show sympathy, social compassion to those nearest the deceased. Sympathy is social compassion designed to maintain society. Again, I shall provide a description associated with the claim that compassion was a complement to self-preservation. 
Compassion was originally a sentiment meant to avoid serious suffering. It allowed some fellow feelings, some suffering, in order to avoid a great suffering that might lead to death. Compassion was antisocial. Yet society becomes in time an effective and nearly necessary means to self-preservation. Compassion must be transformed as a sentiment when the compassion cannot flee the suffering of other individuals in society because humans cannot flee society. The intensity of compassionate suffering for the dying cannot be reduced by the distance required to outpace the screams of the one suffering. Indeed, even after the dying appeared to cease suffering, after they died, the one suffering alongside them continued to suffer. Dying became more than a fear, but a terror. The suffering of the living did not cease, and they inferred therefrom that the suffering of the dead did not cease. Society made suffering everlasting in death. Natural compassion, which originally served the preservation of life, transforms life into something dreadful. Colonel Sherborne maintains that courage may be borrowed from the crowd. And I argue that this loan made by the mass starts in the individuals who lend a small bit of courageous feeling to the crowd. Society, in a great part, is the exchange of feeling. But the sharing of feeling of suffering may damage both individuals with the shared suffering and the society at large. The suffering of someone close to one dying demands some social mitigation so that people may remain social. They need to share and dilute their suffering. The sympathy expressed by social compatriots, the compassion for social suffering, is meant to reduce the suffering of the individual who is close to the dying person. The king elicits the holy tears from the crowd. These tears purge the sufferer of her lonely suffering. They distance the living sufferer from the suffering of the dead. More significantly, they relieve the living of the fear that this suffering portends the death of the living sufferer. The shared feelings of the sympathetic society also give the one suffering with the dead some confidence that the dead do not continue to suffer. The compassion and ministerial sympathy are made holy as expressions in the holy tears. The very religion of society arises out of the congregation of sympathy. Religion in this respect is the loan of social feeling of courage about death and the afterlife. Sympathy is the fellow feeling of compassion transformed to serve social gatherings. It is the social compassion employed to restrict the antisocial effects of nat natural compassion. The king makes himself central to the society of the town because he touches the origins of the social structure, which are the passion for self-preservation and the fellow feeling of suffering that expresses itself as compassion. The town does not abandon its faith in the king and the duke because they invoke the feelings that preserve a society that began in the fear of death. Fellow feeling is transformed from a sentiment that preserves the individual to one that preserves society. The king invokes the holy tears of the town. These tears preserve the society from the constant dread of suffering like the dead. Instead, society takes on the responsibility for preserving the individual. Still, we must admit that there is no apparent deception among the townsmen in the sympathy. The sympathy is true for the, those sharing the suffering with the dying and those suffering for the dead. Even though it's useful, it's true. The other mechanism that the king and the duke use to create confidence in them among the townsfolk is to relinquish their claims to Peter Wilkes's money. They were in the will for half of the property. Private property, as we said, is at the center of the fraudulent construction of society. The original compact of civil society, although it protects the original theft, does not on its face protect the inheritance of the property by later owners. This inheritance seemed as though it is another deception as significant as the original creation of private property. The Duke and the King are frauds. They have no right to the money of Peter Wilkes. But do the orphans, Mary Jane and her younger sisters, have a right to their inheritance? Who gave them this right? Huck stole, this is his word, the orphans' money inheritance from the Duke and the, and the King. He heads downstairs from their rooms 
and finds the doors to the outside locked, a circumstance that prevents him from hiding the money outside. He then hears someone coming and in a panic hides the money in the casket enclosing, enclosing Peter Wilkes's body. The money is deposited near the crossed hands of the deceased. Twain, or is it Huck, is making a joke on the cliche, you can't take it with you. Once private property became stored in money, mean-hearted people could take it with them. They could bury it and tell no one. In many societies, wealthy people convinced the survivors to bury their accumulated wealth with them. This wealth might include slaves and wives. Perhaps the original social compacts imply that private wealth should not remain private, but should revert to the whole community or to the natural condition. The person who interrupted Huck is, as he often notes, the red-headed Mary Jane. She approaches the coffin, kneels, and cries. She suffers for the dead. Here, I think, we see what we might call the economy of compassion. In exchange for the compassion that makes another suffer when someone with property suffers and dies, the property of the dying is transferred to the compassionate one. Dying has the power to return one to a social version of the original state. Yet the return is terrifying because social humans cannot bear the isolated return to the sentiment of existence with the recognition of the fear that that sentiment is about to end. Thus, social humans attempt to remove themselves from the natural condition, from the full weight of death through compassion. Those who show compassion share with the dying the sense of the passage of life, of the sentiment of existence. In return for sharing the sense of death, the compassionate re re receives some of the deceased's property. I suppose if you cry more, you get more. The dying enjoys the sense on their part that the exchange of property for compassion feels as though death is mitigated through a kind of sharing. An inheritance is, is received in exchange for compassion. Compassion justifies the secondhand claim to private property. It perpetuates in the following generation the original fraud that private property enacts. Huck describes without remarking the crudity of the exchange of sympathy for property. Once a second pair of Peter Wilkes's brothers show up, the town forgets its pieties and does not hesitate to dig up and open Peter Wilkes' casket to, to view the identifying marks on his body that would prove which of the two sets are the true bro brothers. And Huck does not expect that Mary Jane will have any qualms at opening the casket to retrieve her money inheritance. Social compassion, sympathy, is part of the fabric of the frauds that constitute civil society. It is usually subordinate to private property. Part three, the fun part, resentment. The part that compassion plays in the establishment of civil society does not immediately reflect upon Huck's truthfulness. He can be the narrator of the adventures because he is naturally compassionate. And in him, this sentiment has not been socialized. To the extent that Huck is merely the narrator, he is not entirely a character in the story. When he is a character, his default action is to lie. He acknowledges as much when he decides to tell Mary Jane the truth. I says to myself, I reckon a body that ups and tells the truth when he is in a tight spot is taking considerable risks, though I ain't had no experience and can't say for certain, but it looks to me anyway, Yet here's a case where I'm blessed if, I, if it don't look to me like the truth is better and actually safer. The narrator Huck by himself cannot be a measure of the truthfulness of the sentiment of compassion because his relationship to society is not sympathetic to it. His compassion remains a kind of social alienation. He tells the truth about suffering, but he may not be able to describe truthfully social sentiments. He has no reservations about lying when entangled in society. Because Huck is an inappropriate person to bring the novel to an end and rejoin Jim to society, Twain returns Tom Sawyer to the story. Readers generally regard Tom's appearance as marring the novel, but Twain cannot leave the support for slavery among otherwise decent, at least decent appearing people unpunished. Huck is incapable of initiating punishment. 
as we've already seen in his compassion for the Duke and the King when they ride the rail out of town. The Phelps family. Support slavery. They deserve punishment. Huck tries to take on the identity of Tom, who is a who is a relation to them. But he does so unsuccessfully. Rather, he sounds a false note. Huck, posing as Tom, explains to Tom's Aunt Sally that he is late because the steam goat went around went aground. Or in second thought, it weren't the grounding. That didn't keep us back but a little. We blowed up a cylinder head. Good gracious, anybody hurt? No, killed the slave, altered. Well, it lucky because sometimes people do get hurt. This is enough to tell the reader who Aunt Sally is. But it is difficult to see that Huck, the friend of Jim, would accede to the opinion that African-Americans are not people. Huck needs help in impersonating Tom. So Tom arrives to provide it. Tom engages in a false freeing of Jim. In Tom's view, it is a false freeing because Miss Watson set Tom free in her will. He was freed by convention. Moreover, Jim's freedom at the close of the novel is false according to nature because Jim is taken back into society and cannot continue the journey down the Mississippi with Huck. Their friendship is constrained by Jim's conventional duties to his family. Jim's fantastic escape from the cabin modeled on the Count of Monte Cristo's escape from Chateau Thief, involves a punishment for the Phelps family since they suffer anxieties associated with their imprisoning Jim along with keeping their slaves on the property. Obviously, this is not an adequate punishment. It's the best you can do in a sort of comedy. Jim also suffers since the escape is in fact a return to civil society where no one is as free as Jim and Huck were before the conquest of their raft by the king and the duke. Tom is the purveyor of social convention. In a society, as Tom notes, in society, as Tom notes, Huck is a ghost. Yet Tom is so conventional that he cannot serve as a measure of the truth or falsehood produced by Huck's natural compassion. He is not bad enough. In the place of the completely conventional Tom Sawyer, we must put up against Huck a character in the novel who is seldom, if ever, moved by compassion. A character that stands outside society in most respects. Someone nearly natural, disappointed with the social contract, but at the same time, paradoxically, who is a captive of society. He is at once society's slave and nature's offspring. Fortunately, the novel includes such a character, Pap Finn. Pap is in some ways the last of the natural humans and the last of the social humans. His critique of society seems to be from the vantage of someone present at the original contract of society and finds that he is disappointed in its results. The original contract is intended to protect those contracting. It is not meant to improve them, to alter them for the good of society. It is good insofar as it defends the contractors. Pap objects to Huck's education. And looky here, you drop that school, you hear? I'll learn people to bring up a boy to put on ears over his own father and let him be better than what he is. You let me catch you fooling around that school again, you hear? Your mom couldn't read and she couldn't write another. Before she died, none of the family couldn't. Before they died, I can't. And here you're swelling yourself up like this. I ain't the man to stand for it. Clearly society, as Pap sees it, intends to alter the original contractors. This reformation is not part of the agreement. Whenever his liquor began to work, he most always went for the government. His diatribe against the government is one of the most racist speeches in American literature. Still, and I won't quote it, still it is necessary to understand the root of Pap's racism. His general argument is that the purpose of government, of the social contract, is to protect one's own Therefore, he has three complaints. First, the government has taken Pap's son away from him. After all the anxiety and expense Huck caused Pap. Second, the government in the person of Judge Thatcher is keeping Pap from the $6,000 in property. His, because whatever is Huck's, is Pap's. Finally, and most revealingly, 
he is dumbfounded to learn that a free African American, not his term, college professor that meets in Missouri can vote that he meets in Missouri can vote in Ohio. He announces that he will never vote again, even if he's sober enough to vote. Twain intends, I am sure, that this speech by Pap show his political baseness. Pap is ill-equipped to vote. He cannot read, and he judges a far better man to be unqualified to vote, since it appears the only voting qualification that Pap recognizes is being a white male. Yet Pap reveals that the original social contract had nothing to do with qualifications. The contractors combined for their own advantage. Indeed, those who formed civil societies after the first combination probably did so only to protect themselves against the original society. The second and third communities were not so voluntary as the first. They joined purely out of urgent self-preservation. The members of these societies considered no other purpose other than their mutual defense of their lives and property. Societies were made up of insiders over against all other outsiders. We cannot examine here the arguments in the majority decision of Dred Scott and the dissents from it. But Pap claims in the manner of Chief Justin Tenney that if people like him, uneducated white non-slave owners, knew that some states in the union had African-American citizens, they would not have joined the union. Societies are structured around the notion of them and us. Pap then maintains that he will never vote again. And he implies that a proper social arrangement requires a renewal of the contract periodically, especially if the society changes its membership. This constitutes a new people and therefore a new contract. In contrast to Thomas Hobbes, Pap Finn argues that if someone refuses to participate in government, he to vote, then his refusal should be understood to be breaking with civil society. He returns to the natural condition and is bound by nothing done by the society. Pap makes a tacit appeal to pre-social conditions to their natural condition. This argument supports that Pap is in a fashion the last natural man. But how, how then is he also the last social man, the human remainder in some dreadful future? Pap is the theorist. This gives you some sense of the, of the value of theory of the last man in the last society. We recall that society is based on borrowing, chiefly of feelings. Here is Pap's version. Mornings before daylight, Huck slipped into the cornfields and borrowed a watermelon or, or a mushmelon or a pumpkin or some corn or things of that kind. Pap's always said it weren't no harm to borrow things if he was meaning to pay them back sometime. But the widow said it weren't anything but a soft name for stealing and no decent body would do it. This, of course, is a theory of borrowing property, and we shall see how it applies to feelings later. Pap has completely socialized property. It has nothing to do with labor, but wholly with exchange. There is, in effect, no notion of how property is produced, but it can be borrowed according to one's need. In fact, it can be borrowed for the hypothetical need of others. There is no private property. There is only social property. The proprietor of all property is society. This may seem familiar to the, similar to the natural condition, but in Pap's society, the right to the chicken or the watermelon is bestowed on the consumer in the prospect that he or she will pay back something of the same kind or value. This is the tobacco economy of loafers taken to its conclusion. All property is borrowed. The distinction between having the right to all property and the right to no property is abolished. Since the property is borrowed, since all property is borrowed, all have a right to it. But since no one pays back anything, no one has a right to it. The economy of property was not really tried until the 20th century with some unsatisfactory results. Yet it is in fact the very long established social economy of feelings. Pap has a slight revision here too. Before Huck's escape from Pap, when Huck occasionally supplied Pap with money, he would get drunk, whoop it up, and end up in jail. A new judge in town tried to reform Pap. He signed the pledge with his mark not to drink again. And he told the new judge that he turned over a new leaf and would be a, a man nobody wouldn't be ashamed of. 
and he hoped the judge would help him and not look down on him. The judge said he could hug him for them words. So he cried and his wife cried again. Pap said he'd been a man that had always been misunderstood before. And the judge said he believed it. The old man said that what a man wanted that was down was sympathy. And the judge said it was so. So they cried again. The judge and his wife give Pap new clothes and, a, and house him in the spare bedroom. Naturally, the thirst comes upon him again. He sneaks out of the house to become falling down drunk. Pap borrows their feelings of sympathy with no expectation that he would repay them. He certainly does not sympathize with their feelings. He wants old time compassion. Sympathy is a social feeling that expects repayment. It usually expects sympathy in return. The judge and his wife cry and Pap pretends to join in. Yet Pap cannot repay sympathy to anyone, but especially someone like the judge. The judge's sympathy expects more than sympathy in return. It expects reform, that Pap would become a new man. He has no intention of becoming a new man. Pap insists that society affirm him as he is. But what is he? Pap is the man of resentment. He reacts against sympathy and makes it an immoral sentiment. He reverses the social order and condemns any sentiment that forces him to reform. But Pap knows he is down and he is not happy with his social condition. Pap wishes to transform the up and the down. He seeks to turn sympathy around so there's not a feeling of social compassion that hopes to remedy the condition of one who is down, but rather is a feeling something like the shame at holding the view that Pap is a down and outer. At least he thinks sympathy ought to be transformed into a sentiment that is a fellow feeling that affirms the kind of people these down and outers are. He wants society to support him in his antisocial behavior. He thinks that he is in truth up because the principled people of society cannot make him conform to their notion of up. He tricks them. He uses their law to grab Huck's portion of the currency that they issue as the glue of society. Still, he is resentful because he does not prevail. No one treats him with dignity, dignity since he refuses to act with dignity. He demands their approval of his disapproval of social decency. He wants from them what he will not give to them. He will not confirm their evaluations, and yet he does not give up social evaluation. His speech against government is made to a public perhaps on its way to vote. The man of resentment is the last social human. He is social because he is bound to social evaluations. Pap takes pride in his family's ignorance, yet he wishes to reverse most social values so that he is on top and therefore, given his character, any social, any real society is impossible. He's addicted to alcohol and money. It is appropriate that he's murdered since his sentiments produce an unsocial war of all against all, where there is continual fear and danger of violent death. His resentment divides him against himself. He wants sympathy, but not in terms with which sympathy, within, within which sympathy operates. He wants a social system of borrowing and feelings and property to which he never returns anything. He has intimations of nature insofar as he lives on the edge of society, but he is a dependent on society for his addictive substances as much as any human being is. He shares the social framework of evaluation, but hates almost so all social values. He is the man of democratic resentment. He wants to be affirmed because he is who he is, but he does not wish democratically to ex extend his affirmation to others. He cannot, because to affirm him is to refrain from affirming others. He wishes the public to affirm that there is no real public. Resentment is self-contradiction. It perhaps can be formulated as the wish for the resentful one to be the, the model social person. And since his, this social model is antisocial, he thereby wishes to discredit society in its own eyes. In contrast to Zarathustra's pronouncement, the society of the last man cannot last long. Almost done. Part four, the liar's paradox. Persons attempting to find a motive in this narrative will be prosecuted. 
Persons attempting to find a moral in it will be banished. Persons attempting to find a plot in it will be shot by order of the author, per GG, chief of audience. It is hard to distinguish, so I leave it to the audience, which of these punishments I deserve. Should I conclude with a moral such as, do not trust your feelings? Or how about, whatever you do, don't follow your passion and be banished? I did not begin seeking a moral or immoral theory of, of the sentiments. It seems to me to be the vocation of the man of resentment. Rather, I sought to test Trilling's reading and discover the relationship of truth to Huckleberry Finn. Yet Huck is two elements of the novel. He is a character whose normal approach to society is to meet it with lies. He does not expect, and he does not require truth from society. Society deceives, and Huck returns the favor when engaged with it. Society relies on fraud, and it could not be without it. It must deceive human animal nature into believing that it secures life, liberty, and property when it chiefly secures society, humans living together too tightly. It is the exchange of deceived feelings. I find, unfortunately, a motive that is a plot, and I'm afraid that I will be prosecuted and then shot. The plot is to shame Pap. For Pap is the Phelps and Wilkes undisguised, and Huck Finn is their long-term punisher. Huck escapes them at the end of the novel as he escapes Pap at the beginning. How do I defend myself against the laughter, which I can't hear, that arises when someone points out that the Phelps and Wilkes seem to be the least resentful people. They are in fact the models for good citizens of a free nation. Permit me to alter the formulation of resentment in a democracy. The wish for the resentful one to be the model for the free person. Since this model is tyrannical, he wishes to discredit a free society in its own eyes. That society originated that society originated in resentment is unlikely because the first humans lack the sentiments that are strictly social. Resentment is the sentiment of a social human reacting against both nature and social convention. The Phelps undoubtedly believe they live in a free country and they are examples of free citizens, but they actively support the slave system and consider and treat African-Americans as though they were not people. In this respect, Pap is the truest adult in the novel. His double and inconsistent life is on display. He rarely hides it. He allows resentment to show. The original social contract was made under the false auspices of freedoms, according to him. Can we agree with Trilling that the novel tells the truth because boys never lie to themselves? It seems to me that the novel works because Huck constantly lies, probably to himself too. He portrays the boy in the story and the narrator of the story as the same person. The character in the adventures is the true social boy who tells the truth only when he must. He is the true social boy because he's a liar. The narrator tells the truth insofar as compassion tells the truth. Since human suffering is always and everywhere, the narrator usually tells the truth, yet he's not the true boy. He is able to follow his compassion wherever it leads. He need not worry about his life among so many liars. The true boy is not truthful and the truthful boy is not the true boy. So I will, so will I disclose the motive of the adventures? In Twain's view, the old education given by the Bible and Shakespeare accentuated the evil division in the human soul. Democratic pretensions with aristocratic vices combined with aristocratic pretensions with democratic vices. America needed a new standard, one that could not be corrupted. Huck is that standard. Twain shows honestly that Huck could not live in America and retain the uncorrupted standard of compassion. In fact, that standard is not entirely appropriate to society. Yet this sentiment can be used to restrain the social sentiments and their dishonest tendency. Twain seems to eliminate the dishonesty of the social conscience and replace it with natural compassion. Huck is to be the new conscience of America. 
Twain leaves the American reader with a version of Elias paradox. Huck's feelings are not the feelings of a social boy. They do not belong to the conscience of anyone in society. They do not tell the truth about the feelings of social people precisely because they tell the truth exclusively about human suffering. They are not the true feelings of those liars that social humans are. Authors of novels can be awfully cruel to their readers. The author of Huckleberry Finn leaves his readers' souls cut in twain. That's it.